Lord Jesus Christ, our God, by the prayers of St. Siloam the Athenite and of St. Sophroni the Athenite, our fathers in God, have mercy upon us and save us. Here we are for the third meeting in our book club series. And we are continuing reading certain excerpts from St. Siloam's chapter on spiritual warfare. And the paragraph that begins with the words, St. John the Divine declares. St. John the Divine declares that God's commandments are not grievous, but a light burden. But they are light only where there is love. If love is not present, everything is difficult. Therefore, preserve love, do not lose it, for though it is possible to recover love, this can only be at the cost of much weeping and praying. And without love, life on earth is hard. To continue in malice means death to the soul, from which may the Lord preserve us. When a soul whom the Lord has sought out and favoured with his grace loses this grace for whatever reason, she mourns grievously and longs to find it again, entreating the Master day and night to forgive her and pour out his mercy upon her anew. Who can describe her sighing, her tears, her genuflections? For long years the soul is at pains to seek the grace she had tasted of and delighted in. And it may happen that the Lord will sorely try the soul, whether she be faithful to him, while the soul not finding within her the sweetness she had known, thirsts for it afresh and humbly waits, drawn constantly to God by the fire of her love. And then St. Siloan goes on to say that with grace life is easy, and patience is required in arid times, in times of dryness. When grace is present, it is easy to love God and pray day and night, but the wise soul will endure arid periods too, trusting firmly in the Lord and knowing that he will not confound her hopes, but will turn to her in his good time. The grace of God is sometimes swift to come, sometimes long withheld, but the wise soul will humble herself and love her neighbor and meekly bear her cross and thus overcome the attempts of the enemy to sever her from God. When her sins, like clouds, hide the light of God's compassion, the soul, though she thirsts for the Lord, remains feeble and helpless, like a bird prisoned in a cage, unable to escape to the green grove whither it would fly in liberty to sing the praises of God. And then St. Siloan makes his discourse a little more personal. It begins a little more personal and that it increases in the personal character of what he has to say about the spiritual life and the warfare, the spiritual 
struggle. Long was I in torment, ignorant of the ways of the Lord. But now, after many years and much tribulation, through the Holy Spirit, I have come to know God's will. All things whatsoever the Lord commanded must be scrupulously fulfilled, for this is the path to the kingdom of heaven, where we shall behold God. But do not think about seeing God. Rather, humble yourself and let your thought be that at your death you will be cast into a dark prison and there languish and pine for the Lord. When we weep and humble our souls, the grace of God preserves us, whereas if we forsake weeping and humility, we may be led astray by intrusive thoughts or visions. The humble soul neither sees nor desires to see visions, but prays God with an undistracted mind, whereas the mind that is puffed up is not free from intrusive thoughts and imaginings, and may even reach the point of beholding devils and discoursing with them. I write of this because myself I have been in a like unhappy state. So here, Saint Siloan is presenting us, is giving us the benefit of his own experience. Let your thought be that at your death you will be cast into a dark prison and there languish and pine for the Lord. This sounds very discouraging at first sight. It sounds rather negative. But he goes on to explain why, in his experience, he has found this thought to be of great help. He says that when we weep and humble our souls, the grace of God preserves us. Whereas if we forsake weeping and humility, we may be led astray by intrusive thoughts or visions. This is, is rather serious. Of course, we say, and I have said many times, quoting the fathers, that we were created for the vision of Christ. We understand this vision to be life-giving, and so on. But we do not expect to see visions. We count ourselves unworthy of visions, unworthy even of heaven, unworthy of anything but the other place. And this introduces us to the mystery of the word that was given to St. Silon. He's going to tell us a little more about this word that was given him by the grace of God after many years of striving, many years of profound struggle against pride, but not pride of the kind that we think of. When we say pride, we tend to think of rather crude forms of pride. In the case of St. Siloan, he strove against layer after layer after layer of pride until he reached the point of the humility of Christ, until he was in a place where he could receive again a taste of the humility of Christ, which he had when he first was given the vision of Christ at the chapel in the mill, 
when he was still a novice and he beheld the living Christ for an instant. But that instant changed his whole life because it was so intense. It was an experience of eternity and it was an experience of eternity with God. And in that experience of the living Christ, he received the state, the spiritual state of Christ, which is why we see him coming away from that vision, praying for the whole world as for himself with tears. And yes, we're going to say a little more about this as we go on. But now he's going to help us to be wary of spiritual experiences, spiritual experiences that go without confession. When we have spiritual experiences, the important thing is to take them to God. I've talked about this in one of my videos, podcasts. We need guidance. We need discernment. Discernment does not come easily. Discernment comes from humility. And humility comes from the practice of obedience. Generally speaking, not to say there are not certain exceptions, but the humble soul in this passage, St. Siloan goes on to say, the humble soul neither sees nor desires to see visions, but praise God with an undistracted mind. That's what's important. What does an undistracted mind mean? That it is focused on the heart. And when is our mind focused on the heart? In short, it's when we weep tears of repentance. We'll say more about that in due course. So the humble soul neither sees nor desires to see visions, but praise God with an undistracted mind, whereas the mind that is puffed up is not free from intrusive thoughts and imaginings. Imaginings, fantasies. These do not help in the spiritual life and may even reach the point of beholding devils and discoursing with them. In another place, St. Sophroni talks about visions, visions of light, which tempt us to accept them as being from God. Visions we know from the lives of the saints as well. The appearance of angels and others, but really of the enemy, disguised as angels, disguised as the Lord, disguised as the saints, and so forth. Once again, great discernment is needed and guidance, spiritual guidance, hopefully guidance from someone who is a little more experienced in the spiritual life than we are. So St. Siloan goes on to say, twice have I been beguiled. He says, twice have I been beguiled. The first time was at the very beginning when I was a young novice and came about because of my inexperience. And the Lord was swift to forgive me. But the second occasion was due to pride. And that time, I suffered long torment before the Lord healed me 
for the sake of my spiritual father's prayers. Notice, it was a long time before he overcame the second beguilement, and he ascribes the forgiveness of the Lord not to anything that he did, but to the prayers of his spiritual father. It all befell after I had accepted a certain vision. I revealed this vision to four men wise in spirit, and not one of them told me that what I had seen was of the enemy. Though vainglory had me in its clutches. But afterwards I came to understand where I had gone wrong. For devils started appearing to me again, not only at night, but during the day too. My soul saw them, but was not afraid because I felt the grace of God with me. So Siloan was being protected, while at the same time, he was being schooled. Schooled by God. Educated, I mean, by God. Trained by God. Exercised. And thus, for many years, I suffered from them. He suffered from these apparitions of the devils even during the day. And had the Lord not given me to know him through the Holy Spirit, and had it not been for the help of our gracious and most holy lady, I would have despaired of my salvation. But now my soul trusts firmly in God's compassion though according to my deeds, I am deserving of torment both here on earth and in hell. For a long while, I was unable to make out what had befallen me. I thought to myself, I do not find fault with people. I harbor no evil thoughts. I perform my task of obedience punctually. I fast, I pray without ceasing. Why then do devils frequent me? I see I am in error, but cannot fathom where. I say my prayers, and the devils go away for a time, but afterwards they come back again. And long my soul continued in this conflict. I talked about it to some of the Stazi. They kept silent, and I remained at a loss. And lo, he goes on to say how this was eventually resolved by the mercy of God. One night I was sitting in my cell when suddenly it was filled with devils. I started to pray fervently, and the Lord drove them away, but they came back again. Then I got to my feet, ready to bow down before the icons, with devils all round me, and one of them standing out in front, so that I could not bow down before the icons without appearing to be bowing to him. I sat down again and said, Lord, thou seest that I desire to pray to thee with a single mind, but the devils will not let me. Tell me what I must do to make them leave me. And in my soul came the Lord's reply. The proud always suffer thus from devils. Lord, I say, thou art merciful, my soul knoweth thee. Tell me what I must do that 
my soul may grow humble. And the Lord answered me in my soul, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. Oh, the compassion of God. I am an abomination to God and man. Yet the Lord so loveth me, giveth me understanding and healeth me. And himself doth teach my soul humility and love, patience and obedience. And hath poured out the fullness of his mercy upon me. Since then, I have stayed my mind in hell, and I burn in the somber fire, yearning after the Lord and seeking him in tears, saying, Soon shall I die and take up my abode in the dark prison of hell, and alone shall I burn there and long for the Lord and lament. Where is my Lord, whom my soul knoweth? And I had great profit from these thoughts. My mind was cleansed, and my soul found rest. Well, there are so many points here. I don't know where to begin, to be honest. It's clear that Siloan has learned to prefer humble thoughts. Self-condemnation. He has learned the benefit of self-condemnation. And we'll talk about that in due course. He refers to the extreme subtlety of the spiritual life. I see I am in error, but cannot fathom where. That reminds me of a story of St. Sophroni where he was bewildered why he had lost grace when in a certain situation he couldn't see that he had done anything wrong. Someone asked him a question about the spiritual life and St. Sophroni had experienced a serious, not a complete loss of grace, but a diminution of grace, a diminishing of grace. And, you know, for the saints, this is unbearable, because once one has experienced great grace, you can't go back. You certainly can't go back to your former way of life. And there's nothing that can console you. There is no comfort. All comforts, all methods of dealing with this from the world are temporary. Anyway, he experienced this loss of grace and he examined himself prayerfully and he couldn't see where he was in error, just like St. Siloan says here. And he prayed earnestly, beseeching God to reveal to him the reason why. And he discovered in the end, it was revealed to him. He didn't say what it was. But it was revealed to him, and it was something on much deeper level than he could have fathomed by himself. This is why we say, for people living in the church, psychology has its uses. But St. Porfirio says, it cannot reach the depths of the heart, the deepest recesses of the deep heart. Only God knows what is taking place there. and. God reveals these things to us as and when he wishes. And when we make an effort, he wants us to make an effort. I see I am in error, but cannot fathom where. The spiritual life, my friends, is very subtle. It's a very delicate thing. When our obedience is as it should be, and we have a healthy bond with our spiritual father, nothing can disturb us. We are protected, but when that is not the case, the grace of God departs. We can lose grace very easily. And as you can see, even those who have reached advanced stages in the spiritual life don't always know immediately why. 
God wants us to grow. God wants us to progress. God wants us to increase in becoming like him and enlarge our heart by his grace. And then he gives us a little more understanding. Then we can take a little more. Then we can contain a little more of what he wants to give us. So, yes, the subtlety of the spiritual life. And then keep thy mind in hell and despair not. I'm going to resist the temptation of saying more about this at this point. I'm going to allow St. Siloan to say more about it in a moment. And following, perhaps even going into our next meeting, because this is a very important word. On one level, it sounds very nice. It sounds rather poetic, beautiful. But for St. Siloan, who was in the midst of this, it was a cosmic battle that he was engaged in. The cosmic battle of the human mind against the mind of the enemy, the pride of the enemy. As I said before, on the most subtle level. And so for St. Siloan, this was a sign of victory. I will just tell you one thing so that you get something of a handle on it. And that is, when we humble ourselves, and when we utilize self-condemnation, I am unworthy of such a God. I am not worthy to loose the latchet of the Lord's sandals, and so on and so forth. Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among men with unclean lips. All our righteousnesses are as filthiness before the Lord. What are we? What is man that he should be mindful of us at all? And so on. These are humble thoughts. These are self-condemnatory thoughts. And these are thoughts which help us to follow the canonic descent of the Son and Word of God as he bowed the heavens and came down from his throne on high, he condescended to the level of his creature and became man. He took the form of a servant and became man for our sake, out of love, to show us in his person how his love is to the end how his love is sacrificial, and how extreme is his humility. So when we condemn ourselves as unworthy, and we begin a condescension, a going down, a self-emptying, to quote St. Sophroni, we imitate the Lord. We become disciples of the Lord in his condescension, in his taking upon himself the injustices of the world, and so on and so forth. And when we accept our injustices, anything that befalls us, good or bad, as from the hand of God, in the spirit that St. Siloan describes, there is something for me here that the Lord wants to teach me. Not for this transitory life, or at least not only for this transitory life, but it is of eternal value. That's why the Lord is trying us. That's why the Lord is, is training us, is helping us to follow his way, the way of the cross, to have a taste and a share, a taste of and a share in his saving passion. And when we do that, we enter the stream of his life. Moreover, we are doing something that the enemy refuses to do, namely, to humble himself. When does the enemy humble himself? Never. He wants to set his throne above that of the throne of God himself. That's where the enemy wants to take us. So when we go down in humility, and we condemn ourselves as unworthy of such a great loving God, merciful God, 
We follow the way of Christ, and the enemy cannot follow us. And so we are free. Free from what? St. Silvan says, he acquired an undistracted mind, free to pray to God, free to stand before God, and to be totally present, not divided, not pulled this way and that way by our thoughts, by the energies of our passions, and so on, but to be focused, to be present, to be able to say, here am I, Lord. I am present. Do with me what you will, because I trust in thy mercy, and I know thy love for us, even me, unworthy as I am. So you see, only the Lord knows how many of us will be given the kind of experience to the degree that was given to St. Siloan. But what is the value of learning these things, of reading the lives of the saints, of following their struggles, their Herculean struggles, and how they overcame them? It's because they are helpful to us. When we experience something of this in our life, then we can turn to their example as we turn first and foremost to the example and the words of the Lord himself, and they give us courage and the sure knowledge that these things can be overcome. We can emerge triumphant. So these things are very valuable to us. The example of St. Siloam may seem extreme, and we don't know if such a state will ever be experienced by us on earth. These are experiences which are given to relatively few, but they are encouraging to all of us. When we read the life of Mother Mary of Egypt, with what she had to contend against, and how she overcame in 17 years, 17 short years, sounds long, 17 years, but she overcame the passions that warred against her. Saint Sophronius, who wrote the life, says she was fighting against those passions as with wild beasts. And after 17 years, she overcame them. And so she's proof that this is possible for us human beings. We have no excuse because the lives of the saints prove to us that the life in Christ is possible for each and every one of us. Now, to some degree, we will all go through these stages in this life as a preparation for the next. So there was something else I was going to say about the example of St. Siloam and the word, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. It shows us how important a humble thought is. For most of us, it's easier to say, thanks be to God, to give glory to God, for whatever happens to us. But that thanksgiving is within the context of what St. Siloan is saying here. Why? Because that thanksgiving recognizes that there's nothing in this world that is truly evil except for sin. Sin is what separates us from God, severs our communion with God, separates us from God. So except for sin, as St. Gregory Palamas says, nothing in this world is truly evil, even if it causes suffering and death. Why? Because we have the example of Christ and his martyrs. What did they do? They accepted their unjust death, which to the world is a huge tragedy. They were killed. They're gone. Finished. But the martyrs accepted their unjust death as from the hand of God, so in the spirit of obedience, with humility, and that turned into their glory. Not a worldly glory, but eternal glory. So this is also a very important basic teaching which emerges from the experience of St. Silwan and how he was given this 
word which signaled his victory. And that was after 15 years of striving to experience again the love and the humility which he had tasted in that first vision. And until the Lord helped him to overcome all the levels of pride, he was not ready to receive the humility of Christ himself. What Father Zacharias refers to as charismatic humility, not ascetic humility, not a humility which is, shall we say, thanks to the efforts of human beings, us human beings, but a gift of God the gift of the very life of God, because that's what happens when we have a genuine vision of Christ in glory. We receive his life in exchange for ours. We give him our mortal, corruptible, and transient life, temporary life, and he gives us his immortal, incorruptible, eternal life. And this is precisely the shape of the divine liturgy. An exchange of lives takes place. And here we see the connection between what St. Sophroni refers to as hypostatic prayer and liturgical prayer. I was going to refer you to a paragraph a little further on where again St. Siloan refers to the two times that he was beguiled, because these are very instructive. So allow me to ask you to turn to the paragraph that begins, I myself was twice deluded. And it comes after the short paragraph, which begins, I beseech all men, let us make haste to repent. And then we shall perceive the mercy of the Lord. So this is page 381 in the American edition. I myself was twice deluded, says St. Siloam. Once the enemy showed me light and the thought tempted me. Accept what you see. It proceeds from grace. Another time I accepted a vision and suffered greatly on that account. Once, at the end of matins, when the choir was singing, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, I heard King David in heaven singing the praises of God. I was standing in the choir, and it seemed to me that there was neither roof nor dome, and that I was looking at the open sky. I spoke of this to four men of God, but not one of them told me that the enemy had made mock of me. That's an additional piece of information to what he said last time, right? When he referred to these four men of God. While myself, I thought that devils could not be singing the praises of God. Therefore, my vision could not be from the enemy. But I was beguiled by vanity and began to see devils again. Then I knew that I had been deceived, and I made full disclosure to my confessor and asked him for his prayers, and because of his prayers I am now saved, and ever beseech the Lord to grant me the spirit of humility. Again, he amplifies a little bit what he had said in the other paragraph, referring to the twofold delusion or beguilement, asking again for the spirit of humility. I said before, I think it was last month, sometimes we're afraid to ask God to teach us humility because we know what that means. We know instinctively, we fear it's going to involve a lot of suffering, and yet it's the only way. So, St. Siloan continues, and were I to be asked what would I have of God, what gifts I should answer the spirit of humility in which the Lord rejoices above all things. Because of her humility, the Virgin Mary became the mother of God and is glorified in heaven and on earth above all others. 
she committed herself wholly to God's will. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, she said. And we must all try to do likewise. Let's move on to at least one or two questions before we wrap it up for this evening. When we lose grace, do we get it back by humility and repentance, even though we don't know the reason why we have lost grace? Uh, that's a good question. Do we get the grace that we lose back again, even when we don't know the reason why? I would say no. I would say the reason why we lose grace is because God is trying to teach us something. He's showing us something. He's revealing something about ourselves to us, which needs to be corrected, which needs to become more refined, shall we say. God doesn't cause us to lose grace. There are many reasons. If you read Father Zacharias's Remember Thy First Love, he gives several reasons as to why God's grace may be lost. But these are reasons, and these are reasons which are revealed to the persons in question as and when God wills, and especially, of course, when the person responds in the right spirit, with the right spiritual disposition, asking the Lord, beseeching the Lord to reveal to him or her the reason why grace was lost. You know, the truth is, we know when we lose grace. We don't always know why. And so it is an encouragement to us to ask God to turn to our Father who loves us, who cares for us. Every moment of every day, His loving providence, His tender mercy, His care for us is there. It remains for us to turn to Him and ask Him as a loving Father to help us to learn. To learn what? the humble way of Christ. The humble way of Christ, not in some general, generic sense of the term, but for each and every situation that we find ourselves in, we need to learn how to apply it, how to live it. This is applied theology, right? Well, after reading the words of St. Siloan, it's normal and indeed quite proper to be humbled. Look at his honesty. That's a form of humility, you know. He is bearing his soul, the fruits of many years of struggle, to us. Why? Because the saints have the same desire as Christ himself to save his people. This is the prayer of Saint Siloan. This is the prayer of all the saints that all the peoples of the earth may come to know the Lord by the Holy Spirit, because God, Christ our God, wants to save his people, all the people. This is the humble word of Siloan. It's so instructive. It's so inspiring. It gives us hope, no matter where we are, how low we may have fallen. Our God is the God of love, who is able to raise us up, and to save us. Who is a God like our God? There is no other God like our God. Glory be to God. As we venture further into the month of December now, which is a preparation for the great nativity of our Lord God and Savior, the only truly new thing under the sun. That's from St. John Damascene. What is the only truly new thing under the sun? There's nothing new under the sun except one thing, the incarnation of the Son and Word of God, how he who is greater than the heavens truly becomes man, assumes our created human nature, bows the heavens, as we said before, comes down to the level of his creature, lives among us, teaches us, shows us his way. Why? Because of his love, his love for his creature. Glory be to God for all things, and God willing, see you next time.